Ja, liebe Zuschauerinnen und Zuschauer, ich begrüße Sie ganz herzlich zu dem heutigen wissenschaftlichen Abendvortrag. Mein Name ist Stefan Reizenstein und ich bin sehr froh, den Vortrag heute als wissenschaftlicher Leiter des Magnushauses moderieren und leiten zu können. Ja, wie Sie sehen, haben wir uns leider entschlossen oder mussten uns entschließen, das heute nur online durchzuführen. Ich kann Sie heute leider nicht aus dem Magnushaus selbst begrüßen. Aber das tut der Sache keinen Abbruch und ich denke, wir werden einen ganz spannenden wissenschaftlichen Abend hier zusammen verbringen. Ja, ganz besonders möchte ich unsere Sprecherin, Frau Professor Johanna, Professorin Johanna Stachel begrüßen. Äh, vielen Dank, Frau Stachel, dass Sie heute dabei sind äh, und dass Sie die Einladung angenommen haben, um heute über Ihre Themen zu berichten. Äh, leider können wir uns nicht persönlich sehen in Berlin, aber das können wir eventuell oder hoffentlich mal nachholen. Ja? In jedem Fall bin ich sehr froh, dass wir Sie heute hier haben als Sprecherin. Und äh, Frau Stachel wird als äh, ausgewiesen und international anerkannte Expertin auf dem Gebiet der Kern- und Elementarteilchenphysik heute über ihren neuesten äh, Ergebnisse und Erkenntnisse im Bereich äh, dieser Physik erzählen und insbesondere über das sogenannte Big Bang Matter äh, bei höchsten Energien dann referieren. Äh, in ein paar Minuten wird es damit losgehen. Ja, ähm, wie schon ein bisschen angesprochen, ist Frau Stachel eben äh, sehr bekannt äh, als äh, herausragende Physikerin. Sie ist insbesondere ausgewiesene Expertin auf dem Gebiet der Kern- und Teilchenphysik und äh, sie ist sehr äh, eng verbunden mit dem Forschungszentrum CERN in Genf. Als Elementarteilchenphysikerin hat man da sicherlich einen guten Draht hin und äh, sie ist insbesondere dort aktiv äh, an dem Experiment ALICE und ist äh, führend an der Kollaboration hier beteiligt äh, bei dem ALICE-Experiment am Large Hadron Collider, am LHC, äh, wo dann die experimentalen Daten natürlich gewonnen werden für ihre Forschung in Heidelberg. Ja, und in dem großen Ganzen im Bereich der Teilchen- und Elementarteilchenphysik ist sie jetzt besonders interessiert und es ist auch im Endeffekt Thema des heutigen Abends an dem Quark, Gluonplasma, was quasi dem Urzustand der Materie entspricht, kurz nach dem äh, Urknall und darüber werden wir gleich hören und ähm, wie gesagt, Frau Stachel ist sehr ausgewiesen als Expertin und äh, international bekannt, was sich unter anderem auch in ihrem enormen wissenschaftlichen Output widerspiegelt. So hat sie äh, über 600 äh, Papers veröffentlicht, hat einen H-Index, ich habe heute nachgeschaut von 131 müsste tagesaktuell sein, also das sind schon Zahlen, die lassen sich sehen und hören, muss man wirklich sagen. Ähm, genau, und ja, in diesem Sinne ist es eben heute ganz im, im, in der Tradition des Magnushauses, dass wir eben über ein gesellschaftliches, relevantes und aktuelles Thema hören. Insofern, dass wir uns jetzt anschauen heute, wie ist die Materie aufgebaut bei extremen Bedingungen, äh, die eben quasi die fast direkt nach dem Urknall vorgeherrscht haben. Heute gehen wir sozusagen in Raum und Zeit zurück in Richtung Urknall, um Details zu erfahren und neueste Erkenntnisse mitzubekommen. Äh, wie hat sich die Materie genau unter diesen extremen Bedingungen kurz nach dem Urknall äh, verhalten? Ähm, das führt uns dann natürlich in die Elementarteilchenphysik und äh, das ist generell ein spannendes Thema, äh, wo man erfahren kann, äh, woraus besteht Materie, welche besonderen Effekte sind hier zu beachten und äh, vor allem jetzt im Speziellen geht es hier dann auch um die Theorie der starken Wechselwirkung, die man da experimentell auch untersuchen und untermauern kann und möchte im Bereich der Quantenchromodynamik. Ähm, und ähm, in dem Zusammenhang ist es eben so, dass es dann bei höchster Dichte und Temperatur, so wie es ja kurz nach dem Urknall vorhanden war, äh, dann der Einschluss von Quarks und Gluonen aufgehoben ist und dann sozusagen hier spannende Physik äh, zu finden ist. Kurz nach dem Urknall übrigens heißt hier etwa 10 Mikrosekunden nach dem Urknall, wie ich äh, gelesen habe in dem Abstract von Frau Stachel und äh, sozusagen, dass man wirklich äh, ganz, ganz weit oder ganz nah tatsächlich 
an dem Urknall dran, wenn wir da nur zehn Mikrosekunden später die Physik anschauen. Ja, jetzt ist es natürlich nicht so einfach, diese Physik zu ergründen. Und zum Glück haben sich in den letzten 30 Jahren die entsprechenden Experimente dann auch aufgetan, äh, um bei den höchsten Energien und Temperaturen und Drücken dann Experimente durchzuführen. Und wie wir alle wissen, ist natürlich hier die, mit die beste Maschine, mit der man das machen kann, der LHC, der Large Hadron Collider am CERN. Und der hat, glaube ich, äh, insbesondere auch für Frau Stachel eben eine neue Welt eröffnet, über die wir heute hören werden, gleich in dem Vortrag, der dann im Übrigen gleich in englischer Sprache äh, durch, äh, durchgeführt wird. Ja? Ähm, bevor wir dahin kommen und eben zu der spannenden Physik hier äh, in den kleinen Skalen bei höchsten Temperaturen und Drücken, äh, möchte ich äh, noch ein bisschen was zum wissenschaftlichen Werdegang und Hintergrund von unserer Sprecherin heute erzählen. Ähm, kurz begonnen. Sie ist von, wie viele von uns vermutlich, Physikerin. Sie hat studiert, ähm, hat Physik studiert an der Johannes Gutenberg Universität in Mainz und gleichzeitig auch an der ETH Zürich. Äh, sie hat dann 1982 äh, promoviert und zwar an der Johannes Gutenberg Universität in Mainz und ist danach in die USA gegangen. Sie war kurz wissenschaftliche Mitarbeiterin und dann Professorin in verschiedenen Levels äh, sozusagen in den USA und zwar an der State University of New York an in Stony Brook, wo eben auch Elementarteilchenphysik natürlich betrieben wird und es hat dann eben auch von der wissenschaftlichen Ausrichtung natürlich perfekt gepasst. Ähm, dann 1996 ist sie zurückgekommen nach Deutschland und ist seither Professorin am Physikalischen Institut an der Universität Heidelberg, äh, von wo sie aus sie jetzt äh, dann auch äh, sprechen wird. Also nicht von der Universität, aber zumindest aus Heidelberg gehe ich davon aus. Ja, ähm, was gibt es sonst noch zu sagen? Sie ist äh, Mitglied in unheimlich vielen wissenschaftlichen Gremien, habe ich nachgelesen. Und äh, nur zwei Beispiele. Sie war, ist glaube ich nicht mehr, aber war lange Zeit im Auswahlkomitee der Studienstiftung des Deutschen Volkes. Hat im Übrigen auch von der Studienstiftung des Deutschen Volkes eine, ein, äh, eine Unterstützung bekommen zu Studienzeiten. Und was ich besonders natürlich hervorheben möchte, ist, dass sie Präsidentin der Deutschen Physikalischen Gesellschaft war und zwar von 2012 bis 2014. Und sie war, glaube ich, die erste und bislang einzige Präsidentin der Physikalischen, Deutschen Physikalischen Gesellschaft. Das ist natürlich hier für uns eine sehr schöne, eine sehr schöne Sache, dass sie hier als Präsident den ehemaligen Präsidenten insbesondere zu uns kommen. Ja, ähm, ebenso lang ist die Liste der Ehrungen und Preise, die Frau Stachel bekommen hat, äh, die möchte ich gar nicht in, oder kann jetzt hier nicht in voller Länge vorbringen, aber ich möchte ein paar ausgewählte Ehrungen und Preise hier nennen. Sie ist zum Beispiel seit 1997 Fellow der American Physical Society. Ähm, sie, sie hat 2014 den Lise Meitner Preis der Europäischen Physikalischen Gesellschaft erhalten. Sie ist seit 2015 Mitglied der Nationalen Akademie der Wissenschaften Leopoldina. Und ganz aktuell und auch eine wunderbare Auszeichnung äh, ist am 6. Dezember letzten Jahres äh, verliehen worden, nämlich das Verdienstkreuz der ersten Klasse des Verdienstordens der Bundesrepublik Deutschland. Und zwar in Anerkennung ihres wissenschaftlichen Lebenswerkes. Das ist eine ganz tolle Auszeichnung. Herzlichen Glückwunsch dazu, Frau Stachel. Und ja, das ist sozusagen hier das, der, der I-Punkt auf, auf der ganzen Laufbahn hier. Ja, mit der Information und mit den Informationen über die Ehrungen und Preise von unserer Sprecherin möchte ich hier auch schließen in der Einführung. Und äh, nun das Wort an Sie, Frau Stachel, übergeben. Wir freuen uns sehr auf Ihren Vortrag, sind sehr, sehr gespannt auf die Ergebnisse und Einsichten, die Sie uns jetzt erzählen können über Ihre Forschung im Bereich der Elementarteilchenphysik. Und ähm, ja, ich übergebe gerne an Sie und wir freuen uns auf Ihren Vortrag. The stage is yours. Einen ganz herzlichen Dank äh, für die freundlichen Worte und natürlich für die tolle Gelegenheit, äh, vor einer so großen Zuhörerschaft. Das entspricht jetzt einem gut gefüllten physikalischen Kolloquium in Heidelberg, sollte ich sagen, 303. Ich habe die Zeit genutzt, während der Einführung auch kurz mal durch die ganze Liste der 
Teilnehmer zu gehen und ich habe viele gute Bekannte und, und Freunde gefunden, aber natürlich viele von ihnen kenne ich auch nicht. Ähm, genau. Okay, and then with that I will switch to English and um, so the topic today will be exploring the Big Bang in collisions of atomic nuclei, heavy atomic nuclei at the LHC. And uh, what we will do is we will explore the phases, the phase diagram of strongly interacting uh, matter. And I will come back to explain the phase diagram in, in a few minutes. I will then introduce you to the Large Hadron Collider at CERN and the ALICE experiment. And then we will enter the world of strongly coupled quark gluon matter. And I will show you just a few selected results that, that carry a strong physics message, as I think. Okay, so now we, we have good evidence that our universe started with a singularity uh, about 13.7 billion years ago. And there's a number of observations uh, in astronomy that point to this, uh, the Hubble expansion, the very well studied cosmic microwave uh, radiation that decoupled when uh, neutral hydrogen atoms could form. So that means when the universe had cooled down to a temperature of about an electron volt scale, and that is what we then call matter dominated. Uh, we know uh, the primordial elements uh, that were formed in the nucleosynthesis in the first about three minutes of the uh, universe. And what I want to take you back to is the uh, matter that existed before the universe had an age of 10 microseconds. And that is a matter that consisted of the fundamental constituents, quarks, gluons, electrons, neutrinos, photons, and uh, we will come back to the temperature, but to set the stage um, already here, this is about 160 MeV or 100,000 times, 200,000 times the temperature in the interior of the sun. And we think the universe existed in this phase uh, between the electroweak phase transition, where the temperature was about a factor 1,000 higher, and which uh, happened at about 10 to minus 12 seconds. Um, now, before uh, we get into more details, uh, since many of you are not particle physicists, uh, I should tell you the basics about quarks and gluons. There are six types of quarks. They come in three generations, up, down, charm, strange, bottom, and top. And I have indicated here the masses of the quarks if we could isolate them as bare quarks in mega electron volts. And you see this goes from rather light, two and five, and then about a hundred and about a thousand. And finally, the top quark has a mass that is yeah, nearly the mass of a gold nucleus. The interaction between the quarks is mediated by gluons. Uh, and there's another important fact uh, you have to know about the interaction between quarks and gluons. And that is that in addition to electric charge, they can have an electric charge of plus two thirds or minus one third they carry also one of three possible color charges. And uh, in an RGB uh, scheme, we could call them, for instance, red, green, and blue. And the uh, corresponding antiquarks have the anticolors. Now, the very different from the electromagnetic interaction where the photon is neutral, the force carriers of the strong interaction, the gluons, have a color and an anti-color. And in fact, uh, there's an octet uh, of eight different types that mediates the strong interaction. Now, in nature, quarks and gluons do not occur freely, but they are confined. That means they are bound by the strong interaction into objects we call hadrons, and these objects are colorless. 
You can achieve this in two ways. You can either bind a quark and an anti-quark of a color and an anti-color, and these uh, hadrons we call mesons, or you can have three valence quarks of three different colors. For instance, up, up, down, that would be the proton, or an up quark and two down quarks, that would be the neutron. And of the different uh, types of quarks, uh, about 150 mesons and a similar number of baryons can be formed. Those are the uh, particles we know. And the, to give you an idea of the mass scale, the proton and the neutron have masses of about 1,000 MeV mega electron volt or 1 GeV. Now, now that we know about the quarks and gluons, um, what I'm going to tell you about is the quark gluon plasma, and that is a macroscopic state of thousands or ten thousands even of quarks and gluons. And this can be achieved by uh, taking normal matter, nuclear matter, for instance, an atomic nucleus, and then applying uh, enormous heat or enormous pressure. And by doing this, the hadrons lose their identity and this new state of matter, the quark gluon plasma forms. And both the heating and compression is achieved in collisions of atomic nuclei at high energies. So now let's come to the phase diagram of strongly interacting matter that is displayed here on an axis where you see the temperature and here you see the net density of baryons, so baryons minus antibaryons, and, and that is um, technically more correct expressed by a chemical potential, a baryon chemical potential. Now, I told you that at low temperature and at normal density, uh, the colored quarks and gluons are bound in colorless hadrons, and this is a, a property called confinement. And uh, I should tell you that at the same time, a symmetry that the QCD Lagrangian has, namely the chiral symmetry, is spontaneously broken in normal matter. And that generates about 99% of the proton mass. So the Higgs mechanism is responsible for about 1%, the spontaneous breaking of chiral symmetry for the, the remaining 99%. And the, uh, the formal theory of uh, strong interaction quantum chromodynamics was uh, completely formulated just exactly 50 years ago by Gross, Politzer, Politzer and Ilchek by uh, the additional realization that at small distances, the coupling becomes weak, the coupling constant becomes small, and this is called asymptotic printing. Now, it took only three years already in 1975, uh, two groups, one in the US, Collins and Perry, and, and one in Europe, Capibo and Parisi, uh, realized that when matter is heated and in fact also compressed, they already realized that the quarks and gluons can be freed from their confinement and the new state of strong interacting matter forms. And already a few years later, uh, this uh, term quark gluon plasma was coined uh, for this state of matter because it has the free color charges, just like an ordinary plasma has free electric charges. Now, uh, normal uh, atomic nuclei sit down here at the axis at zero temperature. At higher temperature, we have a gas of hadrons, all the known types I just mentioned, and then when the temperature is high enough, we come into this uh, quark gluon plasma state where the confinement is lifted, the quarks and gluons are free, and also the symmetry of the QCD Lagrange and the chiral symmetry is restored. Now, I will tell you exactly where this happens, and in the next slide, I want to only mention here that if you stay at low temperature and at high densities, many interesting uh, things happen. 
And it is still a good possibility that uh, quark matter exists in the interior of neutron stars. Now, where does the uh, phase transition happen? For this, we solve QCD on a space-time lattice, uh, in imaginary time. And uh, the computation of the QCD equation of state was one of the major goals of the lattice QCD community since the 1980s. And what I show you here is that after after 35 years, um, there is a consolidated view uh, how the equation of state looks. And I want to discuss just one quantity with you, and that is the energy density, that is this E here. And uh, the energy density has been normalized here to the force power of the temperature, because this would be the normal rise you have in the relativistic gas with, without anything, without any phase transition happening. So in a relativistic gas, energy density over T to the force would be a constant. And what you see is that as the temperature is increased in the lattice QCD calculations, this, there's a dramatic increase. And that dramatic increase uh, signals the increase in the degrees of freedom. And that is exactly what happens if we go from hadrons to quarks and gluons. Already for two flavors of quarks, uh, there are 36 degrees of freedom. Yeah? And uh, you see that this happens over a temperature interval. And this is not entirely due to the fact that the lattice is finite in size. Uh, in fact, this points to a continuous crossover transition. Now, uh, what is the temperature? The most precise measure we have right now comes from the chiral phase transition. Because there we have an order parameter the so-called chiral condensate. Uh, this is large or has a finite value in normal matter, and then it disappears uh, at the chiral phase transition. And what we do in order to determine this temperature precisely, one looks at the susceptibility. So that's a derivative. If you want to see a turning point, then it's always good to look at derivatives. Uh, the derivative of this chiral condensate with respect to the mass. And this is done here for different sizes of lattices. And you should uh, just concentrate here on this uh, violet band. And you see this exhibits a peak. And the peak is the pseudocritical temperature for the chiral phase transition. I'm saying pseudocritical because it is a continuous crossover, most likely. And the temperature in physical units is 156.5 plus minus 1.5 in EV. So now we know what we have to look for. And what are the temperatures we have to exceed if we want to create this uh, state of matter? So we want to do this by a high energy uh, collision of atomic nuclei. So the two nuclei approach each other. They are, of course, in the laboratory. Lawrence contracted because they move rapidly. You will see in one of the following slides how rapidly uh, we have inside the nuclear, the density of normal nuclear matter. Let's maybe look at the energy density about 0.16 GeV per cubic femtometer. When the two nuclei collide, they lose energy. There is compression, there is heating. The heat can be, of course, the heating is then reflected in a temperature. Um, we have this hot fireball of quarks and gluons. And the plasma is created when the energy density exceeds values of the order of the GeV per cubic femtometer or this temperature that I just mentioned. Of course, nothing is keeping the system together, so it will rapidly cool and expand, just like it happened in the first, first microseconds of the universe. And eventually, uh, interactions will cease. The system will decouple into non-interacting particles that we observe in our detectors. Now, uh, coming to the LHC, this is the collider. 
at CERN in Geneva. And what you see here is an aerial map. And the most prominent feature here is Geneva Airport. Uh, back here, we have the Jura Mountains. And also as the dashed line here, you see the border between France and Switzerland. And the circle that is drawn here is the accelerate the location of the accelerator tunnel of the LHC, but it is of course deep underground. And if you really look out of the airplane, you see nothing. Now in the LHC protons and nuclear are accelerated to super high velocities. And uh, to illustrate this in a race of light particles or photons, and protons around the 27 kilometer long LHC ring, light would win by 0.2 millimeters. Yeah, so this is what we mean when we say very close to the speed of light. The uh, kinetic energy uh, per proton is about seven tera electron volt. And with this energy, uh, new things can be produced. Now in, in the LHC ring, uh, the particles circulate in bunches. There are 2,800 bunches each of protons in both directions. In each bunch, there are about 10 to 11 protons, or in the meantime, probably more than that. And uh, they are about seven and a half meters apart, circulating around the ring. And the typical dimensions of such a bunch are the dimensions of the human hair. So something like 25, 30 centimeters long and uh, 25 micrometers in diameter. And at four points in the accelerator, they are brought to collision. So a 7TV photon hitting a 7TV photon and the collision energy is then transformed into new particles, into heat and uh, we observe the collisions at these four points with dedicated and, and specially built uh, detectors. Uh, the accelerator construction itself uh, posed enormous technological challenges. Uh, the beam is kept in, on the circle with 1,232 superconducting dipole magnets with a magnetic field of about 8.3 Tesla. And this is really the largest superconducting magnet system in total, about 10,000 magnets in the LHC. It is also a very cold place in order to keep the magnet superconducting. There are around the ring 700,000 liters of superfluid helium at a temperature of 1.9. The Kelvin, and of course, uh, they are all uh, kept, and nothing of the medium must escape because the amount is, is rather large. And you see here the uh, magnets. Uh, of course, thousands of elements had to be uh, installed and connected during the construction of the accelerator. And uh, the typical schedule uh, and mass installation was going on. That Five depots were uh, installed per night. They were brought down into the tunnel, and then the whole day was spent to make all of uh, the connections. And then the next night, another five magnets. And you can imagine that this took a while from the decision to build the accelerator and the development of the first uh, prototype magnets until completion. It took uh, just about 15 years. And in the uh, end of 2009, the experimental program started. Now, the operation is also posing uh, quite some challenges because the energy that is stored in each of the colliding beams is the equivalent of an ICE train at about 150 kilometers an hour, 350 megajoules. So you, you have the image of the two trains racing against each other. However, if they collide, nothing bad happens because only the tiniest fraction of the beam energy is uh, released every time the bunches are crossing. About one part in 10 to the 11 uh, is really released in collisions. But of course, uh, if the 
things would get off the track in an uncontrolled way, this would be pretty disastrous. And the accelerator physicists had to be very clever to, to prevent this from happening, even, even accidentally. Now, the, the energy that is stored in the magnets is even much larger. It is the equivalent of an Airbus 380 flying 700 kilometers an hour, 10 gigajoule. And that, of course, needs great care must be taken that this energy is not released in an accidental fashion. Now, we will talk uh, in the uh, next uh, slides about collisions, not of protons, but of atomic nuclei. And if two nuclei at the LHC collide, the energy is already really macroscopic. Two lead nuclei, um, the energy is 0.2 millijoule. That's about 6,000 times the mass of the nuclei. And that is really just two atomic nuclei colliding, not a mole 10 to the 23, but two individual nuclei. And in fact, this energy you would hear, you could hear an individual collision if it didn't happen in vacuum, and of course, the accelerator is a very high vacuum. And with this energy, we have really access to, to new physics. And I will tell you about. Now, what I show you here in the movie is a simulation of a collision of two heavy nuclei. And the colorless objects you see in the beginning are the nuclei consisting of colorless protons and neutrons, and then in the collision, uh, the quarks and gluons that are colored are released. So you see the formed quark gluon state, and then slowly these white objects, colorless hadrons, are appearing again. And what you see here in the top is there is a clock running, and that clock indicates the time in Fermi over C. So that means. One Fermi over C is the time it takes light to fly one femtometer. And what you see here, we start at 0.5 and the clock is running. Now light would have flown two femtometers when the three, four femtometers, the first hat ones appear and a few Fermi over C after the beginning, everything is over. So in the early universe, this takes 10 microseconds. In the laboratory, this takes between five and 10 Fermi over C. So the system is of course much smaller, has much less energy, and therefore it lives a much shorter time. Now, uh, in the experiment, uh, we will see the final products of this collision. And I show you here, uh, a sketch of the LHC with the four areas where protons or also nuclei are colliding, and the experiments are between 50 and 100 meter underground. Uh, this is a schematic of the experiment I'm working in, the Alice experiment, and I will not go into uh, any of the details, only to tell you that all of the equipment where we observe the products of these collisions, of course, are custom built uh, first at the home institutes, at universities, at national labs, and then they are brought to CERN and everything is put together. And we are right now in the collaboration about 1,000 scientists from 172 institutes, uh, 40 countries, and about uh, 130 of the thousand are, are from Germany, many of them are graduate students, but also master and bachelor students, so many, many young people. Now, uh, the heart of the experiment and the detector where in Germany we had the main responsibility is the so-called time projection chamber. And it allows to reconstruct up to 15,000 tracks of charged particles in one collision. Uh, this is the interior. It is with about 100 cubic meters, the largest time projection chamber that was ever built. And the way it functions is a charged particle is traversing 
the gas in the interior, it ionizes the gas. There is a strong electric field applied so that the electrons drift to the ends and we measure the point where the electrons arrive. And by a very precise knowledge of the electric field, uh, we have to know this is a precision of one in 10 to the four. Uh, we know the place and measuring the time we also know where the electrons came from. So we can reconstruct with more than 500 million readout pixels, the track of a charged particle with a precision uh, for each point better than 500 micrometer in all three dimensions. And each track, I will show you an image uh, in the, one of the next slides has about 180, uh, space and charge points. Now, once it is all closed up, you only see from the outside the cooling of the electronics. And this is a view into the interior of the TPC and the, the strips that you see here at the side are precision voltage dividers so that we really know the electric field uh, as precisely as we should know it. And the, the yellow boards here are in the end chambers that read out the position and time when the electrons arrive. Um, this is the experiment and the, the most prominent structure is this red yoke, iron yoke that returns the magnetic flux of a, a solenoidal coil. And uh, the iron is about the equivalent of the mass of the Eiffel Tower. Now, uh, of course, what is much more important and dear to our heart is what is inside here. And for instance, this the blue element here, this is the time projection chamber in the interior. There are high precision silicon tracking detectors. Um, this is what happens when the experiment is operated. In fact, we are just coming out of a two-year shutdown where both the experiment and the accelerator underwent major upgrades. And uh, you see here, the, yeah, in Corona times, of course, we have to wear masks. Uh, in fact, to operate the experiment takes just a few people in the counting room and then many teams at home uh, that all watch uh, that their detector is functioning properly. Now, uh, first, let let collision at the so far highest energy uh, per colliding nucleon pair 5 TV. You see here, the red lines are all reconstructed tracks. And in this picture, you see about 3,750 of them. Uh, this is just in a cone between minus and plus 45 degrees, as indicated here. In total, if you could look over the full solid angle, and we have some detectors that cover a much larger range, it's about 33,000 of them. Now, uh, this is a sketch of the nuclear fireball after the collision. It emits particles, photons, electron pairs, but also many hadrons, protons, pions, kaons, shape psi, and so on. And by measuring these different emitted particles, we learn something about the properties of this fireball. Now, the first thing I have to tell you, because we will uh, need this knowledge to understand the following data is, how do we determine the collision geometry? The beams can be steered with micrometer precision, but lead nuclei have a diameter of about 15 femtometers. So there's no way we can steer the beams with that precision. They will hit at all possible impact parameters. Some of the collisions will be grazing when the nuclei just touch each other. Others will be head on. And we measure the centrality or the impact parameter of a collision by looking at observables, and there are several of them that scale with the impact parameter in a monotonic way. Uh, for instance, the number of charged particles that is produced. If the collision is head on, you produce more than if it is very peripheral. And so what we do is we, we look at such observables and we subdivide them 
into percentiles, say the highest 5% here, these would be the most central collisions where uh, nearly all of the nucleons of the colliding nuclei participate. And down here we have crazy collisions. Uh, the first observation is just counting the number of particles that are emitted. And that is shown here in red for the most central, the 5% most central collisions. Uh, and what happens in the collision is that many at the LHC, at least it, it is that simple. Many gluons are liberated, order of 10,000 or more. And these gluons then thermalize, uh, they form quarks and gluons. And then eventually when the system is cold enough, it hadronizes it, the quarks and gluons show up as charged particles. And here at, uh, I should sort of tell you first what the variable is. The variable is a measure for the uh, polar angle relative to the beams. So this would be the direction of one beam here at minus five, minus six, the other beam. Zero is 90 degrees to the beams. And uh, this is also, of course, the center of mass system that is addressed in the laboratory at the, in the collider. And what you see here is uh, that there's about uh, 1,600 charged particles per unit pseudo-rapidity. Now, if we compare this to other accelerators and we compare this to proton-proton collisions, then that is what you see here. You see as a function of the collision energy in the center of mass system, the number of charged particles that are produced divided by the number of participating nucleons so that we have comparable centralities. And the lower data points, these are proton-proton collisions. And up here you see nuclear collisions and you see that the rise is much faster, the number of charged particles produced is much higher. And the reason is that the beams lose a much larger fraction of their kinetic energy in the collision when nuclei are colliding. And we can quantify this here. This is the so-called nuclear stopping power. And what I show you here is as a function of a measure of the longitudinal momentum of the beam the number of protons. So the number of protons, um, I should explain this variable, the rapidity. I said this is a longitudinal measure. It is a logarithmic measure of the longitudinal momentum. So the center of mass system is sitting in the middle at zero. Uh, this is one beam, this is the other beam, and this is for the lowest energy where we think we make the quark gluon plasma. This is at the at this fixed target experiments, sorry, at the uh, procaven, the alternating gradient um, synchrotron. And uh, there, the nuclei stop each other. What you see here is the distribution is peaked in the center of mass, and that means they collide and stop each other. This translated into a shift in rapidity means 1.7 units. The beam is just brought to rest in the laboratory. If we go to higher energies, this is the sun SPS, where the energy is about a factor four higher. We already see a slight onset of transparency and the beams lose about two units of rapidity. Now, if we go to RIC, um, we find that something that was conjectured 40 years ago, namely the concept of limiting fragmentation, that the beams will always lose a certain fraction of their energy, no matter how high the incoming energy is. And that was verified. And at RIC, the measurements also show two units of rapidity. If, if you line up everything, putting the beams here at zero, you see SPS and RIC data, RIC data in blue completely agree. 
So now what does this shift of two units of fertility mean? It means that the incoming beams lose 86% of their kinetic energy. So 86% of the energy is deposited in the collision in the central fireball, and this can be converted to heat. While if you do the same study in proton-proton collisions, you find that the rapidity shift is just below one unit, and that means 60% energy loss. So nuclei don't only have more nucleons and you bring in more energy, but also they lose the energy more efficiently in the collision. Uh, in fact, uh, if we estimate uh, what the initial energy density at different uh, accelerators is, just from the observed final state distributions and what thereby the initial temperature is, we see that in Brookhaven, we have an energy density that's about 10 times nuclear matter energy density and the temperature that is just about above the critical temperature. While if we go to the LHC here, you see that the same estimate gives something in excess of 10 GeV per cubic femtometer and temperatures that are between three, four, or five times the expected critical temperature. So all of these are above the results we have from lattice QCD for the critical energy density and temperature. So we can really expect that we get into the core blue and plasma and I should tell you now uh, whether we have any experimental confirmation that this is in fact happening. And uh, the next thing we want to do is we want to look at the Patronic species that are produced, you know, these 30,000 particles in the collision, what are they? And from this, uh, we will learn about the phase out temperature, the temperature when the abundances of these atoms are frozen in. And so let me slowly take you through this plot. What is shown here is for different particle species going from very light ones like ions, kaons, here we have protons, one GV in mass, we have here particles, baryons, the strange quarks, here we have atomic nuclei like the deuteron, helium-3, uh, hypertriton, that's an atomic nucleus, where one nucleon is replaced by a lambda particle, or here helium-4, and what you see is that uh, it's falling dramatically, the more massive, the less abundantly it is produced. And you see we cover here some nine orders of magnitude. Um, I should also say there are two points of this. There is particle and antiparticle, nucleus and antinucleus. And what you see is they are produced in equal proportions at the LHC. And then the blue line here is the calculation in a simple statistical ensemble, a quant canonical ensemble where at the LHC, because particles and antiparticles are produced in equal portions, we have only one parameter, namely the temperature. And the temperature that is reproducing all of these abundances over nine orders of magnitudes, and you see down here also in insert the ratio of data to model, it is within statistics that the reduced chi-squared here is one. This temperature is 156.5 plus minus 1.5 MeV. So we just keep jumping. Um, okay. And uh, the other thing that's remarkable, and maybe we can come back in the discussion, is that even rather fragile objects like a deuteron that is bound by 2 MeV, its abundancy is frozen in at a temperature of 156.5 MeV. Um, um, this shows you the accuracy with which we know that matter and antimatter are produced in equal abundances. Now one can make a similar analyses at lower energies. And in fact, we started to do this in 1993 
um, this data from the AGS. And what you see is that these are in red measurements of particle abundances, for instance, proton to pion or antiproton to pion, or here K plus to pi plus for different collision energies. And the line is again the analysis with such a simple statistical model. The only thing is going below, away from the LHC. You have two free parameters. You have a baryon chemical potential because the net baryon density is not zero and the temperature. But you see that even very peculiar features can be perfectly described uh, with just two parameters. And, and now we are ready to look at what are these two, what are the values of these two parameters for the different collision systems if we plot them into the phase diagram that I introduced to you in the beginning. So here the temperature in MeV, and here the baryon chemical potential also in MeV, down here at 931.4, these are atomic nuclei, and the color points are such analyses of the produced hadrons in a quantum canonical ensemble. And what you see is that there is obviously a temperature that cannot be exceeded. At lower collision energies, the temperature is lower. I mean, the collision energy is actually also shown here in the top, exceeds about 20 GeV. The limiting temperature is reached. Uh, experimentally, this limiting temperature is 159 plus minus 3 uh, in mV. And that temperature happens to coincide exactly with what is calculated in lattice QCD for the pseudo critical temperature for the chiral phase transition. That is drawn here as the um, turquoise line. And that line stops here at the baryon chemical potential of about 300 MeV, because this is as far as the lattice QCD uh, experts uh, dare to go into the region of finite density. The calculations on the lattice are easy, at zero chemical potential, and they become exceedingly difficult at finite chemical potential because there is a the sign problem in the, in, the, in the action. Okay, so so what do we find? We find that hadron yields are frozen in just at the temperature when the system turns from quarks and gluons to hadrons. And of course, one can speculate whether this is an accident. Uh, obviously, we, we measure here this temperature. Uh, but one can understand it because as the system is cooling, the density drops dramatically. That's what I showed you in, in the equation of state. Right? It is much steeper than the T to the fourth rise. And that means the system also becomes very dilute. And that means while close to TC, we still have multi-particle collisions very abundantly in a very opaque system, within a few MeV temperature drop, the system becomes so dilute uh, that collisions will not change the abundances of hadrons anymore. And so this is what's happening in this very steep rise of the energy density close to the phase transition. So now we know the temperature. Let me maybe be very quick here and show you only uh, one message uh, from the spectra of particles because we, we lost a bit of time with my inability to share the screen in the beginning. So if we look at the spectra and uh, the spectral slopes uh, should reflect also a temperature, right? Just like a Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution. Now what we find is something very peculiar, namely that this effective temperature, if we fit the spectra, is dramatically dependent on the mass of the particle. Ion, K on the C here, the, the helium-3, we sit already at 1.4 GeV. So this cannot be the temperature, right? The abundancy tells us the temperature is 156 
0.5 in the heat and the spectra could maybe exhibit a lower temperature because there are still elastic collisions. So this is understood. And this is due to the superposition of random thermal motion that is characterized by the temperature and ordered hydrodynamic expansion of the fireball. And that hydrodynamic expansion is of course driven by the very large pressure, the thermal pressure at the inside and uh, uh, relativistic hydrodynamics perfectly describes most of the kinematic observables. And what we know, uh, for instance, is that the speed uh, of the expansion at the surface of the fireball is about three quarters the speed of light. In fact, uh, we know that this is not an ideal uh, liquid, it is a near ideal liquid, and we could come back to that maybe in the discussion. We know something about the shear viscosity and the bulk viscosity already. Uh, but uh, rather than explaining that to you, I would now like to come to our probe of decombining. And that is charmonia. What, what are charmonia? Charmonia are bound states of a charm and an anti charm quark. Uh, the uh, triplet 1s state of the charm anti charm quark is the so called a JPSI particle. It has a double name because it was discovered simultaneously at two laboratories in the United States, and the one they called it J and the others called it Psi. So it's the only particle that has a double name. And it has a mass of about 3 GeV and a radius of about half a femtometer. And uh, that is what makes this object interesting. Uh, and the, the, the original idea that goes back to Tetsuo Matsui and Penny uh, already in 1986 was uh, to implant charmonia into a hot core gluon plasma and observe their modification. Now, if we have a high density of color charge carriers, we would effect, expect an effect that is the equivalent of the bias screening in a normal plasma. So the, the interaction between the charm quarks is screened by the many color charges that are in between them. And therefore we would expect the production to be suppressed. Now, the interaction is screened, the, the JPSI, so to say, dissolves in the plasma. And uh, since different uh, uh, charmonia, the, for instance, the 2S state is larger or the P state is larger in extent, um, uh, they have different sizes. And therefore, we expect them to melt at different temperatures. This, this was the picture in 1986. And this is what people started to hunt for as soon as uh, nuclear collisions uh, at high enough en energy were happening, starting in 1987-88. Now, uh, about in the year 2000, uh, uh, we had the idea that at high energies, this picture must be changing and could be changing dramatically because the plasma screens the interaction, but the charm quarks that are produced and they are produced very early in the collision, uh, they stay around, they still are in the system. So when the system hadronizes, also the charm quarks have to find their way into charm hadrons. And if you have many charm quarks in the system, then the probability to make something like a CC bar bound state must grow quadratically with the density of charm quarks. Yeah, because two of them um, have to need to form charmonia. And therefore, at colliders, when you make many charm quarks in a lead lead collision at the LHC, we make more than 100 of them then actually the production should be enhanced as compared to what we would have if there's no core gluon plasma. And this enhancement would actually be the signal of deconfinement because you have this combinatorics of quarks that are not produced together initially, this quadratic scaling, only if you have them deconfined. So the picture, 
uh, that we sketched many years ago uh, is in the top, you would see a collision at Rick, the relativistic Ion Collider at Brookhaven. And in the bottom, this is what we imagine would happen at the LHC. So at Rick, you make in a collision one CC bar pair or zero uh, in, I should say, in one unit of rapidity in the region that is causally connected. Now, if the interaction is screened in the plasma, then they diffuse uh, apart in the medium. And as the plasma is hadronizing, most likely they end up in D mesons that have one charm or one anti charm core. While if we have a large number, again, the plasma dissolves any bound state, the quarks diffuse in the system, but at hadronization, there's a good chance that the charm and the anti-charm will find each other and make a shape side. So if we plot the abundancy of shape size in a nuclear collision relative to a proton-proton collision, where we say we have no core fluent plasma, then uh, this was the expectation for Rick as we go from peripheral to central collisions. And in fact, these are the big data that came significantly after our uh, prediction. And the red line, this would be the expectation for the LHC, where the charm cross section is about an order of magnitude larger. So charmonium enhancement as compared to suppression would be the fingerprint of the confinement. Um, now, uh, this was succinctly summarized uh, just before the start of the LHC uh, in a review article by Helmut Sachsen and Louis Kluberg, where they sketched here the chip side production probability as a function of the energy density. And this is where we are at RIC. And the uh, prediction was if we have thermal dissociation, the number would go down to very small at the LHC. While if there is the statistical hadronization, then it would be could be as large as in PP collisions or maybe even more. Now, this is what we measure. In blue, you see here the points from RIC, and the red points are from the LHC. And we look here in two different kinematic regions. We look at forward rapidities, at forward angles. And we look at the rapidity that is close to the center of mass or 90 degrees. And what you see is that while there are more particles produced at the LHC, and certainly the, therefore the energy density is much higher, there are more shape size. And if you go to mid rapidity, the measurement here is much more difficult than I, I could explain if somebody is interested. You see that the values are even larger. So, this is clear what we are seeing here, right? We don't see complete suppression. We see enhanced production. And this is really the fingerprint of the confinement. In fact, uh, this band would be a calculation with this uh, statistical ensemble where we have to know, of course, how many charm quarks are in the system. And this measurement is still uh, limited in accuracy and will improve much in the coming years. Uh, but within the band of expectation, uh, this is certainly completely in line with this production mechanism. And let me show you as the last piece of information. If we go to the plot that you already know, we had one abundances versus mass, and uh, the blue lines, the statistical ensemble. This is where the shape size is. And uh, this is truly astounding, right? If you compare to an object of the same mass, for instance, uh, the helium nucleus is a little bit lighter, the hypertriton has pretty much exactly the same mass as the shape size. The shape size is produced three orders of magnitude more abundantly. But the blue line is again this expectation in the statistical model. And where do these three orders of magnitude come from? They come from the fact 
that the charm quarks are not produced sonally. They are too massive, not 1.3 GeV, partly because you don't produce at a temperature of 200 mm. They are produced in hard initial collisions. They are deconfined. They move around the system. And just the fact that the charm cross section is at LHC what it is, yeah, and the charm quarks in the system are of the order of 100, that is what makes this enhancement. And the, the factor of the enhancement is this quadratic uh, scaling, and the, the number just happens to be 900. So you see that this is uh, fully borne out by uh, the abundances, and this quantitative agreement uh, is really our proof for the confinement, I would say. So let me come to the end. The 60 minutes have passed, and let me summarize the most important features of what I have shown you. First of all, nuclear collisions at the LHC are an excellent environment to produce the quark gluon plasma, and the large rapidity shift of the colliding nuclei means that a very high energy density can be reached in the fireball. The yields of the produced halprons can be perfectly reproduced uh, as a grand canonical statistical ensemble. The statistical operator is in fact the same as in QCD. And the uh, parameters that we obtain from these fits delineate the phase boundary where the gluon plasma hadronizes. The temperature is in precise agreement with most up-to-date lattice QCD. Um, and uh, even very fragile objects follow the same systematics. And this is something that is certainly astounding and, and we could come back in, in the discussion. Uh, the hadronization of charm quarks follows the same statistical ensemble, only that they are produced externally, so to say, impurities in the system. And the combination of initially uncorrelated charm and anti-charm quarks into shape size is what we think uh, the first demonstration of the confinement in the top one plasma. What I didn't show you is we have several observables now that probe the properties of this QCD medium. We really deal with the state of matter, not these individual uh, elementary particles. And the, the high luminosity area, error, I should say, for nuclear collisions at the LHG is in fact starting this year. The accelerator is just resuming. Uh, operation and in November, December of this year, we will have nuclear collisions at an unprecedented rate of 50 kilohertz. This is about two orders of magnitude more than what we had so far. And we are sure that there will be exciting discoveries lying ahead in this precision era. So with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and um, would be happy to answer any questions you might have. So, yeah, thank you, thank you so much, uh, Professor Stachel, for this very interesting talk. And uh, I very much enjoyed listening to this uh, information and to the result you mentioned here. Uh, for me, it's very new and exciting physics because I'm working in photonics. So the, the nuclear physics is something completely different. And it was very informative to learn about the recent experiments. Yeah, um, I would have a couple of questions. Uh, but I see there is at least one question also in the Q&A. And um, maybe I can just read the question and I invite all the other uh, guests here uh, to post further questions into uh, the Q&A. Uh, so this is the preferred mode that you just put your questions here and I can read them. Um, we could in principle also accept uh, 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 direct questions um, so it's at actually up to the uh, up to the um, listeners here how to to pose the questions. In any case, so the first question which we have here is from Sebastian Dierks, and he asked 
already at the beginning of the presentation actually uh, when you say that the pseudo critical temperature is a certain value doesn't this depend on the baryon density so this was at, yes, at the beginning yes. of the presentation yes absolutely that this is let's maybe go back to the find the phase diagram again uh, so the calculation no, <laughs> went too far. The calculation that I showed you, um, where there was this peak in the susceptibility, is for zero chemical potential because this is where precise lattice QCD calculations can be done. If the chemical potential is zero and there are equal numbers of quarks and anti quarks. Um, what we know is if we go to higher density or baryon chemical potential, the temperature drops. But it, in fact, it drops very slowly out to going from zero chemical potential out to 300 AV, it only drops by about three AV or so. So we, of course, eventually it must turn down to zero. And we now think it does not hit here at atomic nuclei, but the, Phase boundary is probably somewhat beyond. The estimates here are not very precise. We think it is somewhere between three and four times nuclear matter density, where we hit at zero temperature and only high density. So, so whether these points that are measured at the uh, GSI cis accelerator, whether plasma is reached here, we don't know, but we think that in this region, this is still following the phase boundary. And this is in fact also uh, about here is where the future uh, fair collider, fair collider, fair accelerator at GSI will be. So yes, with increasing baryon density, the temperature drops, but at first it drops very slowly. Mm -hmm. So listening to your question, I wonder, can you access the, the area down here to explore the physics also in this? Uh, at this? Very, very, very hard because we cannot do experiments with neutron stars. There is something very exciting uh, that has, of course, come about in the past few years when with gravitational waves, uh, we have for the first time seen neutron star mergers. And uh, with new instruments, the observation there should become much more abundant. Mm -hmm. And we could maybe see dozens of them. And if the observation, if one could see the ring down of the gravitational wave signal, then one would have access to the equation of state of the objects. Now, this, these are temperatures that are in the range of about 80 MeV. Because the neutron stars, of course, in this violent event don't stay cold. So they reach temperatures order of 80 MeV. Mm -hmm. The interior of neutron stars, uh, of course, we are entirely relying on obs observables like the size of the neutron star versus the mass to see which equation of state can sustain neutron stars. Uh, that we know. And uh, currently, it is certainly a good possibility that there is, at the very interior, there's quark matter. But uh, it is right now not more than a possibility. We just don't know now. Mm -hmm. We would need to know more about how the equation of state is really behaving as a function of density. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we will learn a lot more in the next 20 years, but our knowledge is, is much better up here at low density and high temperature. Mm -hmm. Because okay. that's where we have access with, with accelerators. Okay, yeah, so there are more questions uh, which appeared in the meantime. So maybe let's move on to the next question, actually. It's from uh, Wolfgang Hopper. And he asked about the symmetry of matter which is generated. So there is no, I, the question is, there's no idea about the reason that in these collisions matter and antimatter 
is produced symmetrically, but in the Big Bang, not. So what about the symmetry of generating matter and uh, anti -matter? Okay, so, so that has to do in fact uh, with what I showed you in the very beginning, namely that uh, we have evidence that colliding nuclei lose a certain fraction of their energy and thereby also a certain fraction of their momentum. So, so let me illustrate this in numbers. At the LHC, one beam sits at rapidity plus eight, the other one sits at minus eight. Now they are both shifted by two units. So after the collision, the rest of one beam is sitting at rapidity six and the other one is sitting at minus six. In the central fireball around rapidity zero, none of the colliding nucleons remain. So all the protons that we see, all the nuclei we see, they are all coming from produced quarks and antiquarks. None of them are the quarks of the colliding nuclei. They are all produced in the system. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. In fact, you can imagine the collision just like two sheets of gluons colliding, and then in a parton shower, the quarks and antiquarks develop in the first fraction of a Fermi over C. Mm -hmm. so, so this is the high energy picture. At low energy, at the HES, it's the opposite. Yeah, there at uh, the energy is such that the two nuclei stop each other completely and practically all the nucleons you find are from the colliding nuclei. And the ratio of proton, antiproton to proton is 10 to the minus four. Yeah. But at, at LHC, they are equal. So you see here the proton and antiproton number are equal. And of course, for the helium-4, uh, we have only observed 10 nuclei. The precision is much less. But uh, again, they are equal. But this is really because the matter becomes transparent. And then in the center, in the fireball, you have only energy. And the, the matter flies in beam direction. Of course, it does not remain a bound nucleus. It will break up. And, um, but the, the quantum numbers, so to say, travel with the nuclei in forward and backward direction. Mm -hmm. So this is a situation which is quite different from the Big Bang. In other words, is this you cannot compare? Well, in the Big Bang, uh, we have a very, very tiny asymmetry. The asymmetry is much smaller than what we can see here, mm -hmm. where we are at the level of percent. And we do not know what caused the asymmetry in the Big Bang, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, we are lucky that it's there because otherwise we would not exist. We exist mm -hmm. just because of this tiny difference. Mm -hmm. But the, indeed, the excess of matter over antimatter in the Big Bang is much smaller than what we are sensitive to. This is not percent, but much less. Mm -hmm. So it's maybe there, but you cannot measure it, kind of. Yes, and also, of course, uh, there are many things happening in the Big Bang before the core plasma mm -hmm. that we never reach, right? I told you we reach temperatures maybe 600, 700 MeV, but the electroweak phase transition was at not at 160 MeV, but at 160 GeV. Mm -hmm. so, so this asymmetry was created earlier in a machine that we do not reach in a nuclear collision, mm -hmm. most likely. This makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. OK, yeah, maybe let's move on to the next question. It's by Marlene uh, Maxton. Uh, she's asking, are there other methods to probe uh, the Q GP, uh, then the J psi production, and could you talk a bit about this J pi psi production? Yeah, yeah actually, I, I know Marlene Maxton quite well. He's a student in Heidelberg, and yes, the, the, what I showed you are two, three examples, but of course, you don't keep a thousand people busy with just what I showed you. So, so for instance, one can look at the distribution of particles in an azimuthal plane. Maybe I put 
to try to find just one plot if the collision is not completely central. Then, of course, the fireball is spatially asymmetric, right? And the overlap region looks maybe like this. And then the pressure gradient in this direction is much larger than the pressure gradient in this direction. And that translates in, in the end into an anisotropic momentum distribution of the emitted particles. And one can analyze this and what we see here is one can make a Fourier decomposition is really the equivalent of the power spectrum in the cosmic microwave radiation. Now we only see uh, up to about the tenth moment or so, and, and not 1500 like in the cosmic microwave background. But nevertheless, one thing we can learn from this is shown here. We can learn about the uh, shear viscosity over the entropy density, and we can learn about the bulk viscosity over the entropy density. So these are transport parameters in the plasma. We know the plasma is not an ideal gas. It is close to an ideal gas. The values that we obtain here are very similar to what is seen in cold quantum gases at the nano Kelvin level. Uh, of course, the absolute values of the uh, viscosity are very different, but this ratio uh, that is then uh, dimensionless and universal uh, is very similar. So, so from looking at these anisotropies, we learn about transport parameters. Uh, what we are searching for and haven't found yet is certainly the quarks, for instance, these charm quarks that we produce, they are supersonic in the plasma. That means they move faster than the speed of sound. And that means they should leave a Mach cone. So if we look at particles that are emitted relative to what is called a jet, then if we are clever enough to pull out the signal, we should see a Mach cone and in fact, one of my students just defended her thesis and uh, searching for this and she can only put, put a limit. But once you see the Mach cone, then you can determine the speed of sound. So that would be another parameter of, of the core flow and plasma. And, and there are many more examples looking, looking at jets. We can learn about energy loss in the plasma. That means we know how the energy is transferred from a hard, very fast part to the medium and things like that. Mm -hmm. So yes, in fact, uh, there is, it is not always easy to extract a simple message, but th there are many more things we are already learning about the plasma. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, um, there's actually one final question, I guess, from, from the audience. Um, oh, actually, one more. So the one question is from Johannes Reindl, but it's a little bit cryptic, I would say. Um, do you know, Professor Stachel, what is meant by this mu B and T parameter or diagram? Yes, yes, yes. And I should explain this once more very clearly because that is very important. So let's go to the diagram. So this is, this is the temperature, right? This is the temperature the system has. And I told you in the lattice, we compute that at 156.5 MeV. Above this, we have quark gluon matter. Below, we have atomic matter. The quantity mu B, this is a bit more technical. You know that chemical potentials govern um, the abundances of particles uh, which have a certain additive quantum number. Yeah, if you have a statistical ensemble, then for the particles uh, you have uh, in, the, in the partition function, you have some E plus mu, uh, M plus mu B, and for the antiparticles you have M minus mu B. 
So this new, it doesn't have to be the baryon number, this could, there's a chemical potential for any additive quantum number. But this one here, mu b, reflects the density of baryons minus the density of antibaryons. And to illustrate this in a number, for instance, in nuclear matter, of course, we have only nucleons. We have protons and neutrons. We have zero antiprotons and antineutrons. And that means the baryon chemical potential is just equal to the energy or to the mass of a bound nucleon, right? It's 931.4, and that's the atomic nucleus. If this number is smaller, it means we allow a certain degree, a certain amount of antiparticles. And for instance, if I go here, it's squared S of five. This would be the Brookhaven HES. The baryon chemical potential is 540 MeV. This means the ratio of antiproton to proton is 10 to the minus four. If we go to the uh, CERN SPS, cloud of S equal 20, the baryon chemical potential is 200 MeV. It means you have 5% antiprotons. And then here, of course, we don't, you never measure zero. You measure a value with some error. And what we measure is uh, 2 MeV or 1.5 MeV plus minus 2.7. And that means equal number of baryons and antibaryons, equal number of protons and antiprotons. Yeah. And so in this landscape, these are the two parameters that determine what the system is, yeah? the temperature and the net baryon density. And we know this is the phase boundary. And the points tell us this is what a hadronizing fireball has as its parameters when you just look at the abundances of produced particles. Mm -hmm. So from this, we would say up here, we really have a gluon plasma that is hadronizing. And therefore it is frozen out at with yields that reflect this temperature. What happens down here, we can't stay for sure because we cannot go there with the calculations, not yet. Okay, yeah, thank you. I, I think this clarifies in more detail this tier versus mu tier diagram. And uh, we have at least one more question by Eberhard Jeschke, actually. So uh, Dr. Jeschke asks, uh, looking at the 2020 and 23 schedule of the LHC, I assume there's only the Christmas weeks for ions, so no chance to get more time for ions. Is this the case? <laughs> uh, so, so the deal is that one month a year we run with ion collisions. The, the LHC is running typically half a year after all the commissioning and bringing back the beam. And uh, we always had one month and we have the assurance actually from the DG that it will continue this way. So even in the period uh, after 2030, uh, right now we are thinking about a new experiment because certainly we will have done everything we can do with Alice by 2030. But uh, of course with uh, detector technology is rapidly advancing and so we are planning a new experiment that is uh, based mostly on silicon detectors um, and uh, even in that era uh, I think uh, Fabiola Tranotti just told it in the uh, uh, beginning of the year address to all the CERN staff and users she said until the end of the LHC we foresee Iron collisions at about the time of, of one month a year. Of course, uh, one can argue, and uh, for us, it would make a big difference is one month could be two months because we, we double the statistics. Um, on the other hand, uh, 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 the other LHC experiments, some of them are more interested in PP collisions 
Um, and so that this, it, it's a compromise. And of course, you can argue what physics is the most important or most interesting physics. And uh, different people might have different opinions. Um, I think certainly we are not in studying the quark gluon plasma, we are not looking for new particles that might or might not be there. And if they are not there, no time in the world helps you. Um, on the other hand, you can also only uh, make significant limits uh, in the mass if you have enough luminosity. And so, so the approved experimental program makes sure that the big experiments at the LHC all can reach their goals. Okay, so in the interest of time, uh, we can accept one more question, I would say. Uh, the one from Klaus Liegmann. Um, he's about asking about the era of lum lum luminosity, so after 22. And uh, he's asking about the uh, expectations and uh, about concrete and possible results regarding Big Bang and the universe. So to go beyond what we know at this point. So, so for atomic nuclei, uh, the uh, luminosity that was uh, foreseen at the LHC uh, of 10 to the 24 has already been exceeded in runs one and two by about a factor of two. And this allowed that all four experiments could have nuclear collisions and the maximum rate was about eight kilohertz. But you saw that one collision is really producing many particles uh, and therefore, we could not accept the collisions at that rate. So the, this is what the, the upgrade of the experiment was for. Both the TPC had to be modified significantly. Uh, before Alice came online, TPCs were running with collision rates uh, of the order of Hertz. Uh, we were taking central lead lead collisions in the end at about 500 Hertz. But now to be able to go to 50 kilohertz, and this is what we think the accelerator will deliver. So the accelerator will go from eight to 50, but in the experiment, we will go from 500 to, to, to 50 kilohertz. And that is a real quantum jump. Now, if you have central collisions with two orders of magnitude higher weight, that there are really many things we could not do before. Um, let me just give you one example. The JPSI is just one state in a whole spec spectrum of Charmonia. And if we would want to find, for instance, the deep confinement temperature with the same accuracy as we have the temperature for the chiral phase transition, one should see how the spectrum of Charmonia is populated. So how is the 2S state, the P state, uh, uh, maybe the singlet state, how are they produced? And can we, from them, find a temperature for deconfinement? And that would certainly uh, mean to, to get the chi sub C with any precision let's say in the 5% range or so, that, that is only possible with collision rates that are so high. It, our, right now, uh, the calculation I showed you here compared to the data is limited by the accuracy we know the total charm production perception is. And the, the difficulty here is that one has to measure integrated over all momenta. And to go to low momenta and the whole spectrum of charm patterns is very difficult. We have indication that at the LHC, charm quarks that in the end materialize in baryons are much more frequent than in plus and minus collisions. And that means we have to unfortunately measure them with very high precision. And again, we need to integrate down to zero momentum. And that is only possible if you have very good vertex tracking. And we have beautiful new de detectors that are based on that are monolithic active pixel 
CMOS sensors uh, that are of a superb performance, but uh, you need then also the statistics to do this. So it's both the precision of the experiment and the statistics that, that will really, I think, we will come into a whole new regime um, in line three and four of the LHC. And the other thing is that also uh, the other experiments, ATLAS and CMS, have always been part and an important part of the heavy ion program. But now, after the upgrade, also the fourth experiment, LHCB, uh, should be able to participate in the nuclear collisions and uh, with their precision detectors sitting at forward angles, they should also uh, contribute very interesting uh, new results. Mm -hmm. So we are, we are very excited about the, the years that lie ahead. All right, so thank you very much once again. So I'm tempted to allow one really final question because it's the last question and maybe you can give a brief answer to the question by Lukas Ekhoff. He uh, refers to the previous discussion and he asks, could you elaborate a bit on how to examine these Mach cones mentioned earlier when you discussed about um, the, this plasma effect? and different ways to observe it. Yeah, I mean, the, the principle is simple. I don't have a, a picture here, but you know what the, the Mach cone means, that the emission of particles is limited to a certain angular range because uh, the sound travels only with the speed of sound. And if the particle goes faster, then you have an angle, and only beyond uh, this angle you have emission because the, the sound wave can never catch up uh, with say the airplane that is flying at a speed that is faster than the sound and so the same way you can think about uh, the particles that are emitted around a jet so you have to look at the particle that is very fast in the plasma and uh, individual patterns that move at high velocities will materialize as jets. And of course, a jet that interacts a lot is, is losing energy. And that energy, um, or the wave, the shock wave that is generated in the medium propagates at most with the speed of sound. And so one wants to look at the structure around a jet that looks like a cone. Mm -hmm. But of course, uh, you have to isolate this from the overall sort of chaotic fireball that is just governed by a temperature and you have to pull out a, a ring-like structure, uh, maybe opposite to a jet, because usually you have two jets. And um, so I think with the increased statistics of of uh, one three, but we have really two orders of magnitude more. I, I have high hopes that it must be there, right? That the core gluon plasma is a medium. He knows already quite some of the medium parameters. It definitely has a speed of sound, and we just have to be clever enough to find this Mach cone to pull it out of the background. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, so this is something for the future, I would say. And um, yeah. For future graduate students. <laughs> Many bright students are needed. Yeah, with this, I think we should uh, end here and uh, close the presentation. And I would like to thank you so much again, Professor Stachel, for this very interesting talk and for the very interesting discussion as well and for the lively discussions. And I would also like to thank the audience for asking these very interesting questions. And all together, I guess we have now a good, very nice and good update on the nuclear physics of this uh, plasma systems here. Yeah, uh, with this, uh, usually I would hand over now uh, this nice book here. Maybe you can see it. It's about, uh, it's yeah, something like this, yes. It's about Gustav Magnus and sein Haus. I cannot give it to you, Professor Stachel, directly, but I will ask Andreas Böttcher to send you one, uh, one edition, one book, so that you can also have some memory of your talk uh, in hand and to read something 
interesting about the history of our house. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, the final thing which I would like to do actually is uh, to advertise for the next presentations for the next uh, scientific scientific uh, evening lecture. And um, so the next lecture actually will be in about four weeks and uh, it will be given by Wolfram Pernis again, uh, like uh, as a matter of fact from the University of Heidelberg. He moved just recently to Heidelberg and uh, Wolfram Pernis will talk about a completely different but also very exciting topic. Uh, this will be about photonic computing for artificial intelligence. Uh, the talk actually will be in German, um, but uh, everyone is invited to join, of course. Uh, so this will be also very interesting, I assume. And I would also like to advertise at this point for the new uh, program which we have in the in the Magnus House. It's the uh, youngsters program, so to say. It's from from uh, the postdocs and uh, young professors who also will have a new uh, 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 lecture series here. It's called Physics and Pizza. Pizza is maybe not possible at this point, but hopefully later this year or in the future when the pandemic is not there anymore. And this uh, program type is organized by uh, Doris Reiter and Tobias Heindl. And the first uh, talk in this section, which is for uh, young scientists and students, but also for the general audience uh, will will be uh, at the Monday uh, uh, 14th of February. And uh, in the first talk of this kind, Safa Shui from the University of Potsdam will talk about optoelectronics and disordered semiconductors. So everyone is invited to join this next uh, lectures here in the Magnus House. Uh, and I hope that we can have also some uh, visitors in the Magnus House uh, already in February and at latest in March when we have the next talks for sure. Yeah, as a final remark, if you have any proposals, wishes, critics whatsoever, please feel free to send it to me uh, via my email. It's given here, reizenstein at dpgmail.de, or you will find it also on our webpage of the Magnus House. Uh, every input or feedback is welcome. And uh, of course, I would like to um, take it into account and, uh, for instance, take also in in consideration your suggestions for talks and topics. This is, uh, of course, clear. Yeah, with this, let's close here. Thanks again, uh, especially to Professor Stachel and to everyone in the audience. Uh, have a nice evening and see you next time. Goodbye. Bye-bye, everybody.